Well, good morning. I'm joining you from the virtual background of uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan this morning. And when was the last time that you saw a black man so composed who was going to be talking about Black Lives Matter and Planned Parenthood uh, in an episode of The Way Forward? Here we go. Hey, I'm bringing on my buddy, Jason Plummer, who's coming in, pastor of Litchfield Baptist Church in Litchfield, Illinois. He's at the door about ding, 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 ding. We got to get him in the show. What's up, my dude? What's up, my man? Good what you got going you. on over there? <laughs> uh, Y'all got snow? Y'all got snow? In. Yeah. Snow's in. Snowed in. Uh, I don't know. We got somewhere along the lines of... Um, Maybe eight inches, maybe maybe ten inches in some places. Okay. Um, okay. But today it's like negative three. It's cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cold. Yeah. Okay. Actually, you have us beat. I'm uh, I'm on tour in Michigan, and uh, I got the first part of that. We got thirteen inches the first day, then we got a little snow the second day, and then I traveled to Grand Rapids at eleven degrees, and then um, it snowed last night here, just a little bit of snow. Yeah. But it was. It felt like one degree this morning. It was, I think, 11. Oh, yeah, well, once it starts getting in the single digits and below zero, it don't, it's all relative at that point. <laughs> exactly. It don't cold, matter. Cold, cold, is, and cold is cold. Um, this is odd for us. I think this is the, the most snow I've seen in Illinois since we lived here, what, six years, I think? Almost going on seven years. Yeah. Um, I, we haven't had, I don't think we've ever had this much snow. So this wow. is odd. Now, I was kind of kidding with my my kids a little bit that Stace and I were talking. We, we grew up primarily in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and this was just kind of a normal, like, you know, like the way you describe Michigan, you'll, you'll get, you know, 13 inches one night, and the next day it'll snow another five inches or six inches. And then, um, and we, we really didn't shut down school. Like, they shut down school here for three days. Um, I don't. We don't. We didn't shut down school for snow. We shut down school if it got to like negative sixty, and the heaters wouldn't work. Uh -huh. That's when we shut down school. Yeah. Otherwise, I mean, you just either you hoofed it with snow boots and all that. But you know, you, people, uh, people aren't trying to do that <laughs> these days. Or you just get on your snowmobile and you get up there. Either way, um, it's all you know. It's all about let's take it easy. Let's make sure. And, you know, part of that, part of that is the reason kind of like things that we talk about on this show. If we want to talk about equity, there's certain yeah. people who have, you know, more advantages in the ability to get to schools uh, when there's adverse conditions like that than people who obviously would be disadvantaged in, in situations like that. And I'm not just talking about yeah. the cities. I'm talking about rural places as well and some of those outlying areas. And so, you know, we just try to make it easy, we try to make it easier for everybody. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you, I was one of the disadvantaged. I had to walk. <laughs> <laughs> I was dis We had to walk up hills both yeah. ways. We disadvantaged hey, look, two I ways. Can, I can make a legitimate claim about walking uphill in the snow because we lived. There you go. We lived in uh in town, but we lived on the downside, and I can just remember walking to the school was always an up, gradual uphill climb, and I had I had parents who were all about character building. So it yeah. didn't matter how much snow or how cold it was. They just said, you know, bundle up and and get hoofing. And that, it was it was a solid mile um, to get to get to the school. It, it was a nice walk. It was, yeah. it was a healthy walk. Well, uh, yeah. So <laughs> those were the days. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to let you guys know that the comment section is turned on today. Bam. Oh, wait, I just hit a button, hit the wrong button. I'm trying to be all fancy over here. Hit the wrong button. Comment section is turned on over here today. We're going to give a couple of shout outs today. Jason, who you want to give some shout outs to this morning? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you what. I'll, I'll shout out to my family. We had to be stuck in the house for three days together. We didn't kill each other. So everybody, I was going to say, everybody's still alive? Everybody good? Everyone's still alive. No, okay. one's, no one's gone off the deep end. Um, Stacy's made wonderful dinners and we even had dessert and stuff. It's like crazy. It's good. Good awesome. stuff. A little yeah. bit of family time with you guys packed in. It's kind of like a vacation. We had a about staycation. 72 hours of family time. <laughs> 72 <laughs> so. hours of family time. Yeah, well, good. it has been, uh, you know, a blessing. I'm up here in New York, um, or not New York in Michigan. I'm excuse me, Michigan. I stopped on the border of Michigan in Michigan city, Indiana. I was with a wonderful family and 
got a chance to do some online Bible studies with the church that I'm going to be at on Sunday night, River of Life. And so excited about the opportunity to spend some time with them and then spend some more time specifically with the pastor. We did a couple of hospital visits or at least one hospital visit and then did a couple of Bible studies. And so that was just kind of a really neat time, unexpected, um, but it, we, we made the most of it. Well, you know, it's one of the things I appreciate about the way you look at music. Um, and I really hope that this never changes as part of your model, if you want to say, is um, it, it, it's not like you just travel around to concerts and do things um, just music related. Everywhere you tend to go, there is more to a ministry mindset, whether you're shoring up a pastor or you're helping evangelize, you're doing something. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I, I would love to see more musicians in the music industry who are, you know, making a profit off of Jesus do that. Mm. Mm. If I can, I'm trying to be kind. With my, with my <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm just going to keep it. I'm just going to keep it Erskine music. But uh, I was touring yeah. with another artist at one point and he said, man, we, we had played about five or six shows, but we had gone around and visited some people. Yeah. You know, and he said, man, I don't know, like if this is part tour because like we're playing a bunch of shows every evening. But like during the day, like part of this is also a mission trip. So I feel like yeah. it's part mission trip and part yeah. tour. And I thought that's yeah. exactly that is my sweet spot right there. Like because yep. the show is only going to take so long. We're going to set up. Yep. We're going to do the thing. We're going to spend some time afterward. That's great. Great. Yeah. But during the day, like visiting pastors, visiting, you know, friends that are in the area having those uh, connections and associations, that's also important yeah. as well. And so we just kind of keep it 500. Real quickly, I want to give a shout out here. Get this comment stuff off the of screen here before I can see this. Can you guys see this? This is Grace Christian University. I wanted to give a quick shout out to these guys. I was with them yesterday, Jason. I met the president, Ken Kemper, and we were talking about plans uh, later on in the year and into 23 that we'd be able to do together on campus. And he's like, hey, you played basketball. Let me introduce you to the basketball coach. Basketball coach is like, hey, you want to come out and talk to the guys? I'm like, sure. He's like, hey, you got some shoes? What kind of question yeah. is that? <laughs> of course I got shoes. So yeah. I suited up. I'm I'm back in the blues again. What's up? Coming out there yeah. for practice, trying to see if my 44-year-old legs can go. <sighs> okay. Well, I'm a little sore today, but we did what we could. And we had a yeah. great talk with the basketball team, and they gave me some gear here. So representing Grace Christian University, want to give a shout-out to you guys. Hoop, hoop, hoop. Let's go. That's awesome. Let's do it. So where where are they? They're in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay. How long they've been around? They've been around for a while. <laughs> they yeah. they uh Dr. Kemper said they've got 300 students on campus and they've got about five or six hundred students that uh are gathering virtually or <coughs> travel on site. Okay. So they're around a thousand ish. Okay. So small, small private school. Small private school, and they've won the Division Three, I think, uh, basketball championship. They win it most years. The last time they won it was 19. They didn't win it last year, um, and they're a little down this year, but they win a lot of national championships in their division. Okay. So some good hoopers out there. They got some. They got a good squad. <laughs> I think they can do it. They stop turning the dang ball over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to our topic today. There's some folks who are tuning in, and I, I would imagine there are some eyeballs that are watching us today to figure out what a black man and a white man are going to be talking about when we talk about the subject of, can I say the big A and not get censored? Mm. Hmm. We're going to talk mm. about abortion today, and we're going to also talk about Black Lives Matter. I want to make sure, is my microphone working still, Jason? You're, you're, you're a little, you're, you're good, but you're definitely more distant than you normally are. How about okay, that? yeah, it it is. But I'm going to make sure I get up in the microphone yeah. so everybody can hear me. And I'm shouting not because I'm an angry black man, because I want <laughs> everybody to hear me this morning. Ah. Um, and also, we're going to be talking about Planned Parenthood just for the algorithm. Mm. So, uh, shall we pray? You want to lead yeah. us to the throne, my, my friend? Yeah. All right. Father in heaven, you are the God of life, and your son has come to give us abundant life. And so I pray, Father, that as we discuss these things, Lord, that it's always life um, that hangs in the balance. It's always life that we're pursuing. It's always life that we're trying to give, Lord. And so I just pray over all these moms, 
Lord, and all these women um, who have either had an abortion or thinking about it, Lord, uh, whether they're black, white, Asian, Hispanic, God, that you would intervene and you would do a marvelous work, Lord, of grace, um, and you would help them and, and keep those babies alive and here. Help the church to be compassionate and, and formidable, Lord, and to be yes. uh, firm in our convictions about life, but uh, willing to, to go the distance to do whatever we can to save lives. Um, and so I just pray uh, that your grace would abound, Lord. Your truth would, would reign as, as high as it deserves to be, and uh, that all of us would come underneath it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, my friend. So as we get into this, uh, it is ironic, don't you think, that it's Black History Month. The achievements of so many Black people are being heralded out there. I love that part. Ida B. Wells. I've, I've heard exposés on a whole bunch of different people who have just done some incredible things in our culture and our society. Really excited about that. But it's ironic, don't you think, that with um, the March for Life that we've recently had and a lot of the things that are going on in our society that are uplifting the Black people, BLM has been a little bit quiet. Planned Parenthood has been a little quiet. You know y'all been quiet? Because y'all been killing black babies in the womb. And so I just want to make sure that I, because I have another, I have a brand. I have, this is brand protection right here, Jason. Yeah. Sorry I have to do this. I'm sorry I have to change on you in just a moment and switch from the Erskine, the guy that you know, to Erskine, the guy who's protecting the brand. And I want to make sure that I protect the brand because I don't want people to come in and think that my brand is associated with anything other than a solid, canonical, biblical understanding and that my brand is unapologetically pro-life for every life. And so if we're gonna talk about Black Lives Matter, that's re referentially correct because I think my life matters, but so does your life and so does everybody else's life and especially in the womb. So I just want to be clear about that, Jason, this morning. <laughs> just in case. Just, just in, in case. case. Just in case. Because, because there are, like, um, when I was meeting with Dr. Kemper yesterday, he was commenting on some of the shows that he had seen. So there are presidents of universities and people who watch this show. And, like, when I meet with them, they're like, hey, we want to figure out what Erskine is about. And so the stuff that I say on this show actually doesn't matter. You bring me in or you're not going to bring me in. Yeah. And that might be the difference between thousands of dollars to feed my family. But I just want to make sure that if you're not bringing me in because this is not a brand that you can endorse, you just need to understand I'm okay with that. Yeah. There are other brands that associate with what it is the platform is. Okay. So all that yeah. out of the way, how did you want to start this today? Because I'm I have a, a lot. Um I'm I'm willing to, to kind of follow your lead a bit. I, I think or I mean uh we, we just got out of pro life month, January, right? Um yes. and we're moving into Black History Month. Abortion mm -hmm. in the black community has had a long history. Um, mm. And it's not just, I mean, black community, Hispanic community. Um, and and there's a lot of things um, happening on that front. And you sent me a really interesting article on kind of the squirreliness of BLM a little bit that I just thought was well-written and, and just really insightful. Um, so I was really curious of, of, and I've always been kind of curious about this, how how do you receive this information as a young black man? Um, okay. What is the black community's take on um, abortion in particular and the black lives matter? Because I get the impression that even okay the black community is a bit divided on abortion. Okay, okay. Um, and so I would love for you to speak into that. Um, I would also love for you um, to help me understand uh, you know, as, as a believer, I, I watched a, a video of a, of a woman who's, um, she's the director of the <laughs> surgical <clears throat> stuff at, at the abortion clinic in St. Louis, um, <clears throat> who is on the one hand affirming her, her, her Christian values and, and love for, for Jesus and um, the necessity that God has called her to abortions. Um, okay, okay, yeah. And so I'm like, Ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I need to I need to hear that. And so before I speak, you know, too critically, you know, I just want to hear I want to hear you out on that. And and I, I know I know where you stand. Like I know where you 
But what I don't know <laughs> if is, I wasn't clear about that. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I know where you stand. What I don't know is is how all those connections are made, um, and and inside of a community that I'm, I'm not as familiar with. Right. Okay. Like, okay. Not, okay. Okay. I don't know how those dots are connected. Okay. Um, and uh, and then I would love to just to see um, what you think the future holds for um, abortion, black community, and, and abortion in general. Uh, okay. Um, you know, you have a forecast yourself. So those are my, my initial thoughts. And I'm really interested in hearing your perspective. So I want to hear it. Yeah. So I'm going to jump into that a, a little bit. Uh, because if you're, not, if you're watching this today and you're thinking, Erskine just got set up. Well, Erskine just got set up. I'm I'm now the representative for all of the black community. And I'm going to give Jason <laughs> what is the hey. black voice of consciousness among all black people that you should ever meet. And so if you ever wanted to know what black people think, only watch one show and it would be this show because I'm about you to tell you Erskine. what black people think. <laughs> so so to be fair, right, <laughs> to, to be fair, um, I I don't have as much access to the African American community as say you do. I, I have a handful of friends and the other friends I do have, most of them are gone. I, I, I you know how much time I spend with you? Like <laughs> we text each other throughout the week and then we do this show and we talk. So when I have when I have a question, <laughs> this this is gonna come out wrong, but when I have a question, you're kind of my go to guy like hey yeah the go to hey hey what do you think I, about this? <laughs> right. And I appreciate that. Some of some of our offline conversations are legendary and then we yes. have the show to follow up with that but yeah. so yeah I, I was only joking because I, I do receive that in the spirit in which that comment was yeah given. That, that is don't, a measure. don't ever think <laughs> and i gotta put this out here you're not my token guy so oh. don't don't ever ever think that um <laughs> i i literally have questions that will come up and instead of just assuming too much i'm like hey erskine's got insight on this and yeah. so um so yeah, check it out. That's a really easy answer to start out with. And then I want to go through some history as to why we're doing this. And the yeah. comment section, comment section, look quiet this morning, but comment section is open. You guys can talk about what you want to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about what we want to talk about. So um, that question, you alluded to it at the beginning, actually, Jason, the black community. Listen to me, black community. If you're black out there and your skin looks like mine or you're brown, it's a little lighter than this or a little or whatever you are is divided on the issue. Mm. We are divided on the issue because as passionately as I sit here, knowing that I'm about to read a statement of history from history here in America, the things that have been perpetrated against black people in America systematically that have taken place as passionately as I am about the issue of what the church of Jesus Christ and redeemed individuals can do about that. There are people who are equally as passionate. On the other side, Jason, who say we must not mm. let Planned Parenthood be disbanded. We must not let this systematic genocide <laughs> of black people be disbanded. Mm. They are equally as passionate on the other side of that. And I get that because black people are passionate people, brown people, passionate people, white people, passionate people. I get it. We're a divided America. And I would say by virtue of that, a divided African-American community. Now, let me make a couple of historical statements because we need to get into this. We need to get into this quickly because we're not going to be here all day. But listen, here's my statement. Black and brown people have been systematically targeted for elimination since before the 1940s in America. That is a bold statement, but I'm about to tell you this. This is a direct quote from a man by the name of Lanthrop Stoddard. Do you know who Lanthrop Stoddard is, Jason? Mm -hmm. Okay, listen to what this statement says. This is the 1940s. Non-white races must be excluded from America. The red and black races, if left to themselves, revert to a savage or semi-savage state in a short time. Guess who Lanthrop Stoddard was friends with? Good old Margie. Margaret Sanger. Oh, wow. And we all know who that is, who is the yeah. founder, the founder of the ABCL. Well, that name doesn't ring a bell, does it? That's not Planned Parenthood, is it? That's the founder of the American Birth Control League which later became Planned Parenthood because that name didn't age very well. In the 1942, and on her ABCL board, a number of controversial directors, one of them was Lanthrop Stoddard, Theodore Stoddard, a journalist and author um, who served on Sanger's National Council. 
Her board of directors was a committee of the first American birth control conference. She pub he published Sanger's publication, her birth control review, the BCR. And like Sanger, Stoddard was a member of the American League Society and connected with none other than the K and the K and the K, the K to the three. Mm -hmm. And like within many eugenics movements that helped plan and found Planned Parenthood, Stoddard had a poor view of minorities and people of color. From his own words, I think that's referentially correct. The terms yeah. eugenics, according to um, Francis Galton, who was a cousin of Charles Dar Darwin, eugenics, like Stoddard and Sanger and others within their leadership movement, believed that the superior race's duty was to limit the population of those who were seen to them as inferior. So the American eugenics movement set their eyes upon eliminating the population of the black race. Abortion disproportionately affects black and minority women. According to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, black women account for 38% of all U.S. abortions. 38%, Jason. Yeah. Even though black Americans make up yeah. just 12% of the U.S. population. Yeah. And I'm going to make a statement and then you jump in here after this because this is, I was reading from an article that you can find in the show notes for today. But here's my words and listen to every word that I must say. I'm going to get close enough to the microphone that you can hear this. My goal is to stop the vast number of baby deaths in the black community. I believe we have injustice in America and it is rightly seen in school, in education in inequities, punishment, access, reading, and vision. I believe that mental health and police interaction are problems in our society. We have had and continue to have problems in housing, ownership, and certain issues in certain places in America. False and abusive incarcer incarceration policies. However, before all organizations and advocacy groups are raping the black community of the potential of hope of a better future and black and brown people by killing them in the womb. Yeah. I I read that statistic for CDC. There's, there's another one um, that's really troubling. When you get into New York, and these largest, particularly in New York, 70% um, of abortions that are done in New York are done to um, are, are, uh, by African-American women. Um, that number is pretty common in Chicago and, and the rest of them as well. well so it, it's pretty intense. You know, I sent you a, a link and I, you can put it in the notes too. There was a, a policy report that came out. I think it was by the, um, <clears throat> Cure Foundation. Um, but inside of this, um, policy report, they, they have testimony from Richard Nixon, um, and regarding population control and, and some things like said, it said, and you can check this out because we posted in the, in, the, in the show. You can, okay. you can see the link. It's just a couple of pages in, like six pages in. But you have, in regard to population control and to, to race, and this is due right to abortion, um, um, and, and Nixon uses some strong language here, so just kind of um, bear with me, right? Okay. But he says... Uh, a majority of people in Colorado voted for abortion. I think a majority of people in Michigan are for abortion. I think in both cases, well, certainly in Michigan, they will vote for it, abortion because they think that's what's going to be uh, boarded generally are little black bastards. Um, quote, How'd you quote, as I told you, we walked about it earlier. We talked about it earlier that a hell of a lot of people want to control the Negro bastards. Um, Hide your kids. Uh, you know what we're talking about. We're talking about population control is what he's saying. That's, mm -hmm. out, of, that's out of Nixon's mouth, right? Um, so uh, the, this idea that, that eugenics or, or population control is all in a conspiracy world, that's just not true. There's just too much data and too much testimony out there um, that says that there were ill intentions and that there was malice toward our brothers um, regarding abortion policies. And the fact that most abortion um, centers are within walking distance of black and Hispanic communities, um, the way the funding goes, uh, it, it, you just can't, you, you can't look away from the, the amount of evidence that says this is not just about health and general health. This, this was an intentional act um, to, to, hurt a, to hurt a community inside the United States. Um, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. I, you know, I, I, had to, I had to come a long way with that, Erskine, 
Um, cause I used to kind of think it was all part of the rhetoric and the, and the propaganda of, of just, you know, um, here, here we go again, you know, the, um, abortions are all around. Why is it, why are we singling out the black community? Why is it always, you, uh, the, the minority community, um, seem to be talking about it when it's happening to the white community and everything like that. Um, but when I began to look into its origins and the motives for it and, and, and actually reading testimony of people and, and reading things like this from Richard Nixon and policy reports, you just can't walk away with that thinking, oh, this was, this was all about public health. That's just not true. Bro, I'm, I'm, glad you, not true. I'm glad you said that, bro, because I would think there would probably be a lot of people on the front end of this are like, see, another angry black man who's talking about <laughs> trying to drum up an issue that is specifically related to the black community so he can keep this uh, cultural fire going of things that are, he's one of those woke individuals who's out there trying to get some uh, yeah. little nonsense foisted upon Americans to like torture their conscience about what's going on in the black community. And to hear you say that, I think has more value on this show than to me be going be going off and talking about the things that are all firsthand accounts. These are direct <coughs> quotations. <coughs> on one of the links in the articles, it shows you a primary source document yeah. of the people in this eugenics movement who signed the document, who have in place a eugenics movement to systematically eliminate as many of the bastard, as Nixon said, or what they consider to be, uh, what was the, the language that they use? almost animal like people who are in our yeah, society. Yeah. And so it's well, a systematic thing that you don't have to nobody's drumming anything up. This is what is actually there and this is how people used to think. Yeah, I mean, there's people have, this is how some people think. <laughs> there's there's always the the political agenda behind it and then there's this um fear that's living behind it. Um it, part of that that policy report, the cure the cure document, um they 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 make a statement that I thought is really telling. Um, they say then and now Sanger's organization has used trusted leaders to convince the black community that abortion as a form of birth control is not only acceptable, but also beneficial to African-American culture. Uh, that, that is just, yeah, yeah. Hey. You, you can't look at the, you can't look at the data, um, and look at the evidence. And then you walk into the, the black community and wonder like, why, why would you support something that's, that's taken the lives of 19 million black children I mean, just even look at it from a, um, I don't know, a, say from a political perspective, right? That's potentially 19 million voters or 19 million advocates for the black community you've just done away with, right? Mm -hmm. How is that helpful or good for the black community? Um, but they've invested a lot of money and time trying to convince black leaders that, hey, this is the best way to, to deal with your, uh, your population and, and deal with... Um, uh, the community and, and and to limit poverty and to, yeah, to limit yeah, yeah, um, yeah. all that stuff and you're like mm, that is that is horribly malicious <laughs> more black people more problems in america more yeah. black people more problems hey i want to and this is in my notes for today because i want to make sure i say this i want to stop the lying and the silliness that comes from planned parenthood i'm going to read you a statement from what planned parenthood says uh, and this is in the show notes as well. You can read in its entirety, but I'm only going to read a little bit of this nonsense. The, and this is my quotes, quote unquote, fundamental right to bodily autonomy, the belief that every person should be safe and free in their body, guides Planned Parenthood's work and our fight for reproductive freedom. State sanctioned violence makes the promise of freedom unattainable for black people in this country. That includes reproductive freedom. If black people do not have the bodily autonomy necessary to live their daily lives, or protest the violence against their lives without the fear of violence or murder, we can never truly achieve reproductive freedom or justice. And that's how I think people might need to get slapped. And I'm trying to be mm. nice about that. But you just mm. straight out lied because that silly language that they're offering to black people and brown people and people that are out there is neither offering them liberty or justice by yeah. killing these emerging black children, like you were talking about, people yeah. who would be productive members or members of society who would go one way or another, they would be influenced one way or another, are eliminated as they are emerging, receiving yeah. in their deaths, neither liberty nor justice. 
I think we got a bigger issue <laughs> than this fundamental right mm -hmm. to autonomy. You're not even offering it to yeah. the babies themselves. And so I, I just I need us I need us to get past right. the silliness of Planned Parenthood and their nonsense that they're trying to co-op what seems <coughs> to be a growing movement of people who are concerned about justice and then partner and parlay alongside of a justice issue and say, yeah, we're we're equally fighting for black people in this country. We want you guys to have justice. What a disingenuous statement that is. If you don't even let black people and brown people be born because of what you do and you make money off of it. Silliness. Yeah. Well, that is, that is, <sighs> we were just having this discussion yesterday. Many of the problems that we have come back to money at some place. Follow <laughs> and, the money. And, and, and money is as much as a part of, um, of abortion as, as anything. Uh, I know that the Veritas uh, put out some videos the last couple of years um, describing um, people in the abortion industry discussing how they can uh, take the tissue from aborted babies and sell it and, and do different things. Um, atrocities you thought would just be outrageous to the American public um, that's being allowed, especially with your tax dollars, um, to, to take an advantage of these, these women um, and, 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 their, and their time of need and their, and their time of, of help. Um, it's an, it's insane. And, and here's the thing, going back to something you said earlier that I find troubling. When you talk about that, um, that, that quote of how convincing the black community, this is the best thing for the black community, right? They have spent years defining the terms and implanting the language to make it seem like the life of the baby, um, or the, or the, the, um, the, the, the value of autonomy and individual rights is equal to the life of a human being. Um, and, and you're like, wait a minute, something's crazy. Cause, uh, for the abortion to, to work in that regard, um, the baby has to die. And therefore you have to say the baby's not a person. You mm -hmm. have to, the moment you say that that baby's a person, well, now your, your whole language and argument falls down. So they spend all this time convincing um, people that that baby's just a fetus, that baby's just a group of cells, that, that baby is just a, a non-living organism that's completely dependent on the body, and they spend all this time ramping that language down um, so that you can justify killing that child. Um, because it's not a human, it's not a person, it doesn't deserve the same kind of rights that you have. Um, I was... <clears throat> uh, you know, Bill Nye, the science guy, right? This guy's all about science. He was just on uh, YouTube um, just saying, hey, the science is, is, is faulty. The fact that abstinence doesn't work or, or this, uh, this birth control doesn't work or this doesn't work. And he's using it to justify why you should have an abortion. And then he's trying to use the science language to say, um, hey, that's not really a life. That's not real life. You don't, you don't, you know, and then on the other side of his mouth, he says, nobody likes abortion. And my question to Bill Nye is why? <laughs> why, why does nobody like abortion? Well, because you're, you're killing something, right? And it, it's, it's like the inconsistencies, but yet all the time and the effort and the money spent in um, influencing the community to just justify it. There's no there way that's random. Yeah, but there's no way that that is just by coincidence. You get you guys. That know. is a deliberate, intentional um, program, if you will. Yeah. Uh, to attack, to go after. Oh man, there's, there's no just way. A, yeah, there's just a lot here because, you know, I'm not big on conspiracy theories because I kind of shade more of the sovereignty of God and if you know, I feel like if there is a government conspiracy and they're all going to get us and, you know, they're going to, they're, then they're going to get us. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't have enough guns. I don't have enough, you know, cameras around my room and like sensors and things to like, not let them, they're going to get me. If they want to get me, they're going to get me. So I'm not so, so worried about them getting me. Um, but one of the things that is troubling to me is that there has got to be, if I can throw out a conspiracy theory that I think is not even a conspiracy theory, it's just probably the way that things are. Um, people who receive money as advocates for 
or from Planned Parenthood to be able to foist these lies into the African-American community. There's got to be people who are on the take and commensurate with that article that I gave you with Black Lives Matter. The mm. that's a whole nother show for a whole nother day. But the misappropriation and the non-transparency of funds makes you wonder who is mm. paying these people to say these lies? Mm. Who is getting rich off of saying these lies? Who mm. is going into the black community and receiving uh, some benefit financially as a result of their partnership with Planned Parenthood? Mm. I can't but agree, just believe that there are people who actually believe that it's better for the black community that we abort these babies. Now, I'm going to read something here mm. that I think is an argument that we need to consider for a few minutes. According to Planned Parenthood's former research arm, the pro-abortion Guttemacher Institute, approximately 75% of women who have abortions either live below the poverty line or a low yeah. income. Over yeah. half of them are already parenting one child. And according yeah. to the Guttemacher study, most women choose to have abortions because they fear the ability to provide for a new child or fear the continuing mm. their pregnancies would interfere with their education, their work, or their ability to parent their born children. Considering these injustices and, as injustices and inequities the black communities have faced and continues to face, it should not be a surprise that black women have 38% of all abortions in America. Adding to this, the fact that black women are routinely preyed upon, targeted, and mistreated by the abortion industry. It is already clear that abortion doesn't help women. Jason, you just talked about that. It's already clear that abortion doesn't help women. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. If we want to help black women choose life, offering tangible resources like pregnancy resource centers, those things are crucial, along with addressing the social and community problems that have led black women to believe that they have no choice about abortion. Now, here's where I want to this is I want to maybe land the plane in this segment of what it is that we do with this idea. OK, so there's a real fear out there that if these black children are born in poverty, then that's going to perpetuate a problem and a cycle of poverty and a mm. cycle of incarceration and a cycle of all of these different um, community barriers and community strains in society. The fear of that is we don't have enough people to come alongside of these families and in particular these women to help these children and to help these women and to help these families. Jason, can the church do anything about this? Oh, man, this this is where the church can be prime, right? Because uh, what is what is the voice that's missing from this whole discussion um, seems to be uh, the, the the church and and truth. Um, because what what I find interesting is um, just 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 for instance, you know, uh, if you go to the the, the CDC, I, I believe it's. 85% of abortions that take place come from unmarried women, unmarried couples, right? So you talk about um, the sanctity of marriage and, and what God does in marriage and, and why women who have to have or feel like they have to have these abortions out of fear don't have the support they have. Um, have I would be willing to argue, and this is conjecture, but I'd be willing to argue that they have not been taught the sanctity of marriage according to God's design or plan. Mm, um, they have come not, on. They do not understand the value of of this covenant relationship that till death do you part and how the uh, the the family and the baby and the child and how under the sovereignty of God he will care. That argument is completely just ignored and dismissed. And that's where the church needs to begin to grab uh, these young people. And start giving them the truth, and start. Um, that's just well, that's just marriage. That's uh, the idea of family and the importance of family. Um, you know, this it's one of the things that, and I and again, uh, I would let you talk to this. One of the things I admired so much about the black community, particularly as I, I had to read about it in the uh, civil rights movements and 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 even before the '60s, was just this unity among the family. That was just remarkable, like absolutely remarkable, just how strong um, that family um, was and how that contributed to change in America. Uh, these mm -hmm. united families, mom, dad, kids, um, and this uh, structure. And, and then to have to overcome all the crap it had to overcome, because you, you, can't, you can't tell me 
that when you divide up generations of people in, inside the, the slave movement and you break up families there, that that doesn't have repercussions later. And yet uh, you still find in the black community this massive commitment to unity and care for the family. Um, and then all of a sudden we started putting, impregnating these ideas about abortion and, and, and what the reason for poverty is and all that. And, and the church is like, yeah, well, it's, you know, we'll go along with that. Well, no, that's not life. That's not life at all. That's not abundant life in Christ. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Anyhow. Well, yeah. So here's where I, I, so I, I need to keep checking and making sure because I did this last time. You know, I did a show, a whole show without you on the other side of it to tell me that my microphone wasn't working. Yeah, your mic's on. Okay, I, like, I want to check and make sure my microphone is on because yeah. I feel like we're saying stuff today and I feel like this is a place where people could comment. But Jason, we got zero comments in the comment section. Yeah, well, zero comments in the comment section. And I hadn't even started yet. I'm about to go in. No, I'm actually this is my concluding argument. Here's what I want to say. Here's what I believe is the way forward. Here's where we land the plane, at least for me. The solution is that we've got to call the church to stop their weak need worship in the area of a Adoption, abortion, mm. advocacy, and support for these women and these children. And so I would submit our family. As, on. I would submit our family as uh, Article A of what it is that I just said. We've recently had three respite placements and placements in our home of foster children who are in the system. This next week, because I'm out of town this week, this next week, when I get back, there will be another foster child that is coming to our home for respite. Why? Because if we're going to say that abortion is wrong and we're going to say that these families, these women who are having babies who are in adverse conditions and who are struggling, somebody who's a Christian better step up and say something about it and do something about it. And yeah. no, listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying that everybody out there who's a Christian is going to be a foster parent, but I think everybody out there who's a Christian ought to be helping. Yeah. That That is... That is huge, because on, on the one hand, you, you've got to help young these young folks understand the sanctity of marriage under God's sovereignty. That's not going to change overnight. You still have to embrace the single mom, the, the issues, the decisions that were made. You still have to love the child. You still have to pour resources into making sure that these children, um, when they are born, they are not just put back into a situation that's going to create that cycle that everyone's afraid of. Can you imagine what would happen if, <clears throat> I think I read a statistic somewhere that if every Christian family took a child from foster care and an adoption, that there would be no more need for foster care or adoption. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that somewhere? I, I have heard that. Statistically, yeah. it lines up. I mean, it's Can not. Can you imagine what what impact the church would have if if we just trusted the Lord love these kids, love these families, found ways to disciple these moms and, and, and take these children and, and do that hard work and, and take the grace that God has, has given um, in our lives and share it with other people um, like you're doing. I mean, you and Kelly, foster care is no joke. <laughs> There's no joke. <laughs> that is no hey, joke. Hey, I mean, you, hey. you've got to trust the Lord. You've got to have the right heart and mind into it. But what if the church trained people to be that way or to think that way, um, to equip people, right, and then involve them in the process so that we can begin to address these areas? Uh, we, 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 would, we could shut the abortion industry down. We could shut the arguments down just like that. And actually be a good witness for Christ. Yeah. Maybe do more evangelism, see people come to know uh, yeah. Jesus yeah. as their Savior. So here's and the statement. Be, oh, go and ahead. It would be, it'd be hard. There'd be a lot of sacrifice. You'd have well, to be very kingdom minded. Yeah. Right? So he, you start messing with people's complexity, their messiness, and you're going to get a little messy, a little dirty. But but doesn't the blood of Christ conquer that? I mean, doesn't the grace of God? I mean, that, that's what I read when I read the scriptures, right? That my grace is sufficient for you, even in your time of weakness. And my grace is sufficient for that baby. Amen. Amen. And that mom. I mean, I'm going to give you the last word as we close out here, but I want to make sure that I'm clear about this statement as well. I'm, I'm trying to get as close. I'm trying to get as close to the microphone as I possibly can <laughs> on this show. You see me ducking down. It's not because I'm trying to duck responsibility for what it is that I'm saying. I'm trying to actually say it so it's clear to people. 
I'm on some different stuff over here, guys. Y'all just need to know this about me because I truly believe that all the, and I, I censored myself, all the moaning and complaining about the millennial generation and Gen Z and how off the chain they are and how much activists they are and how woke they are and just how they're just going to take this country down and whatever. You can say a lot that you want to say about that. But you know what they do in their activism? They actually get involved. And I know young families, young millennial families who are adopting children and who are engaging in foster care. Why? Because yeah. They want to actually see that their relationship with Jesus Christ actually matters. You know what they didn't see in generations that came before? A kind of faith that was connected to what people actually did. And so a lot of the deconstruction on the positive side of it and a lot of the pushback against the church that has millennials and people leaving the church is because they see the church as a bunch of frauds. They're a sham. You talk about all this relationship with Jesus Christ. You talk about loving people, helping people. But the very people that you know either statistically or you can look them in their eyes who need help, you turn the other way. You're happy to have your worship service and then go out to eat afterward. And then you're done with your Christianity. Well, yeah. you know what? If there's not some millennials and some people who step up, one of two things has got to happen. We either got to have a great revival that's going to bring these other generations and older generations back to an understanding the fact they've got to live their faith out. Or this millennial generation has got to pick up the slack for people who have not done what they need to do according to the relationship with Jesus Christ or the kingdom of God. Yeah. No, I, so, <clears throat> millennials. That, that's a, I think that's, go a, get that's, them. A, that's a fair, that's a fair critique. What, what I enjoy about that is that when, when we talk about Jesus came to give life and give it abundantly, um, this, this particular group is taking that seriously inside the church. I mean, that, that abundant life is not just the American dream. That abundant life is to be given to, to everybody. Um, and here's the thing is I go back to this and I have conversations. Um, this is where living together matters. Mm. Right? This is where community matters. Your problem becomes my problem when I make it my problem. Right. Yeah. When, I, when I go and, and, and do this. And so, um, you know, one of the things that, that Stacy and I, we live in this rural community in Litchfield Um and and we live smack dab kind of in the middle of the town. Um, on, on one side of our street, we've got really good, wonderful neighbors, and we, we, we commune with those guys, and it's great. Down the street, we, we've got a condemned house and a meth lab and all that uh, that's that's going on. Because uh, we, we, Stacey and I heard a new term about Litchfield. It's they call it Litch Vegas, I guess, because mm. um, <laughs> all the it's kind of the sin city, right? Um, and the more I began to, to, to get outside of my circle and I began to interact with people who have these substance abuse issues and who are in poverty and their family's a mess and, and educational things are, are, are lacking, um, and especially that are unchurched, um, I began to see them desperately needing abundant life. And I realized that God has placed me here to give it to them. And, and I wouldn't know their problems if I didn't go engage their problems. Well, the same thing with this abortion issue is essentially we have to learn to live together to help each other. So that mom who's facing that decision understands that that abortion is not really the, the answer, that there is a community there that is willing to, to come alongside her, help her, love her, care for her. And even the young man who's supposed to be there by her side and helping her to come alongside him and help him and and love him and, and try to support this, this, uh, this new family. And I think that's the church. <laughs> that's that's the purpose of the church right there. Amen. Go do that. Um, and, and make it, make it happen. And that's that model of ministry. I just, I, you know, I'm, I don't want to be a, too critical, but I, I think that's what the millennials are complaining about. And the Gen Zers are playing. They're, are they're just like, that's what Christianity is. And we're just not seeing it from, from you, you older guys, um, yeah. on a consistent yeah. level, you know, on a consistency that would mark the church as a whole. Yeah, you know what I mean, so it's, I did, I did put up Black Lives Matter, and I was going to stop with my thing, but because I put it up on the screen, I didn't want people to to flash across and be like, "Hey, they're talking about Black Lives Matter and supporting Black Lives Matter." Yeah, um, 
I put this up as a tease for some of our upcoming shows because we do need to get into the fact that on this issue, Black Lives Matter is a sham. It's a sham. It's just an uh, absolute. Man, they, you want to talk about an opportunity to really speak volumes? Here it is. <laughs> so, so <laughs> yeah, silent. yeah, you're 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 irrelevant in this discussion because uh, you guys are on something else, and it's not yeah. actually Black Lives. <laughs> yeah. So, so I just want to make sure that I was clear about that. For the reason why I put that up there was not for some tacit support or some secret symbol that I was putting up there. You know, you got to clarify all these things for people today. They'd be like. I'll get start getting messages and say, hey, uh, you put a picture up of such and so, or you put a picture up of Black Lives Matter. Does that mean you support them? I'm like, did you watch the show? No, did we you saw watch, a picture. Did you watch the show? <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> so we got we to we got do it that way these days. But that's okay. Clarity is king. Clarity is king. I All right, it. let me pray, and then we got to get out of here, bro. Yeah. I got to drive today. All right. Saginaw, baby, here we come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to uh, take the treasure and the gift of grace and what that means in a, a life that is regenerate. And we get a chance to use all the faculties of loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. With our mind, we can read and we can reason with some of the things that are going on around us, statistics, firsthand accounts. With our heart and our soul, we know, that, Lord, that there's something that must be done. And by the power of the Holy Spirit that you will enable us to do that. So far as we keep our, our mind and our heart and our vision trained on seeking first the kingdom of God, the advance of the gospel in our generation, in our time, and uh, the glory of King Jesus. We thank you, Father, for, I thank you for Jason and his family. Uh, they haven't killed each other. They've been together so much, <laughs> so much time over the last few days. And that's actually been a harmonious time, uh, an encouraging time, we pray. And I thank you, Lord, for the travels thus far the folks that we have met and the, the folks that we have an opportunity to meet on this trip. May you continue to glorify yourself and bring clarity to this issue. If there's anybody from Planned Parenthood that's watching this and feels assaulted, I pray, Lord, that that would not be an assault from me, but that would be a direct conviction of the Holy Spirit that is teaching them that there's something that is grossly out of step, but it can be made right through a relationship with Jesus Christ. If there's folks from Black Lives Matter who are watching this and saying, we're not going to bring Erskine in to an event because we don't want to hear his voice. I pray, Lord, that they would bring both Erskine and Jason to an event and let us just share from our heart about what could be changed and what could be made right. Um, and so we don't know, Lord, but your Holy Spirit will guide us and guide the perpetuity of this broadcast to those that need to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's the way forward. We love this show and we think you should too. Subscribe to it and enable the notifications so that you don't miss a single episode.